you for joining us. Um, my name is Gavin Cleesbees. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the third program in our Disability in the American Past series. Uh, we are recording this program tonight, uh, and all four panel discussions, the conversation fo that followed our film screening this past Saturday, and the lecture for our educators workshop uh, will all be available on our YouTube channel uh, in the near future. I want to take a moment uh, to thank the scholars and activists who we worked with over, the, over about the past 10 months uh, to plan this series. We appreciate their help and great ideas. Um, I also want to thank our co-sponsoring organizations who have helped us spread the word about the series. We have about 200 people registered for the program this evening, so I think our partners have done a good job of spreading the word. Um, out of the hundreds of people joining us, uh, I'm sure some are joining uh, an MHS program for the first well, I'll take a moment to introduce the Massachusetts Historical Society. We were founded in 1791, which makes us the oldest historical society in America. Since our founding, we have been an independent nonprofit organization that provides access to our collections. Today, our research library contains close to 14 million pages of correspondence, diaries, and documents. We hold the papers of three of the first six US presidents, as well as mothers, inventors, preachers, and protesters. We make all this material available to researchers for free and also maintain an active schedule of programs and seminars throughout the year. We're able to do this thanks to the support of our members and donors. We hope you'll return for future events or we'll explore our collections. Of course, if you enjoy our programs, we hope you will consider supporting our work by becoming a member. Three panelists, a moderator uh, and an ASL interpreter who is joining us from Partners Interpreting. Our moderator this evening is Kenesorn Wong Shri Shanalai. Dr. Wong Shri Shanalai is the Director of Research at the Massachusetts His Historical Society. He received his PhD from the University of Virginia and prior to coming to MHS was an Associate Professor in the Department of History at the Angelo State University in Texas. He will introduce the other panelists, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Wong Shri Shanalai. Thank you very much, Gavin, and good evening to everyone joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters today and to moderate the conversation. Our first presenter is Dr. Laurel Dane. She is an assistant professor of American studies at the University of Notre Dame, where she is also affiliated with the John J. Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values. She is currently completing her first book which examines the exclusion of disabled people from legal and political rights in early America. This book will be published as part of the Alejandro Institute of Early American History and Cultures series at the University of North Carolina Press. Her work has appeared in, among other places, the Journal of, so of Social History and the Journal of the Early Republic. Professor Dane has held long-term National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships at the Omohundro Institute for Early American History and Culture, as well as the Massachusetts Historical Society. Our next presenter is Dr. Sari Altshuler. She is an Associate Professor of English and the Founding Director of the Health, Humanities, and Society Minor at Northeastern University. She is the author of The Medical Imagination, literature and health in the early United States. Her works have appeared in various journals, including Early American Literature, 19th Century Literature, and The Lancet. She directs Touch This Page, Making Sense of the Ways We Read, an award-winning multi-site and online exhibition about the multi-sensory experiences of reading. She also co-chairs the critical Health Humanities Seminar at Harvard's Mahindra Humanities Center. Nicole Belolan is the public historian in residence at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for the Humanities at Rutgers University Camden. She is an historian of material culture and disability history, holding a degree from, DeWin from the Winterthur Program in American Medical Material Culture, excuse me, and a PhD from the University of Delaware. She is the co-editor of The Public Historian, the preeminent journal in the field, and serves on the board of the Disability History Association. 
Her latest publication is an article titled The Material Culture of Gout in Early America, published in the essay collection, Making Disability Modern, Design Histories. Drs. Dane, Altshuler, and Bololan, thank you for joining us today. And first to Dr. Dane. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Kid. And I'll start with an audio uh, description. I am uh, a white woman in my mid thirties, um, sitting in my home office. Uh, there's a window behind me um, and a lot of plants um, because my toddler has started to eat the plants. And so we're uh, keeping them off limits. Um, so to begin our panel, um, I'd like to make a brief note about accessibility. Um, and I share this with you on behalf of all the panelists. As scholars of disability in the past and advocates for disabled people today, uh, we care a lot about ensuring your access to our presentations. And that means we've thought a lot about the best ways to communicate with you. Accessibility is always a crucial goal. Um, but when we're talking about disability and disability history, um, we think it's an opportunity to be really intentional and explicit uh, about the choices that we're making and the ways that we're inter interacting. Um, particularly because disabled people have been marginalized historically um, and continue to be so today in some settings. We thank the program organizers for doing some of this access work for us, um, arranging for live captioning and an ASL interpreter. Um, and thank you <laughs> very much for your work. Um, we will also do our best today to speak slowly and clearly in plain language to explain in detail what you're seeing on the screen to use large font size and high contrast color schemes in the visuals uh, that we might share um, and to describe those visuals as we go. We will also drop uh, accessible outlines of our talks in the chat. Uh, Zoom is amazing um, and because this panel is remote, uh, we encourage you to move around, have a snack, uh, do whatever you need to do to feel comfortable while accessing our panel. Um, and if there's any point, uh, there's something we can do to increase your understanding or access um, please don't hesitate to put a suggestion in the Q&A box. Uh, as part of being accessible and inclusive, we also want to alert you to some potentially sensitive um, and disturbing language and subject matter to come. Today, we'll be talking about how disabled people were excluded uh, and discriminated against in early America. We may also be talking about how they were included and integrated. In both cases, we may use language from the time period, um, including words that are offensive today. Um, we use these words as sparingly as possible, um, but we do so not only because um, they're true to the source material that we're drawing on, um, but also because um, many of them have particular legal, social, cultural, political meanings in early America uh, that are important to the subject matter of our talks. So um, we ask that you're aware of what's ahead and adjust your participation accordingly. Um, and we also look forward to uh, talking more about access and disability history in the Q&A. Um, and so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sarah. OK, great. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Um, I'm going to try dropping a link to an accessible copy of my talk here. Um, hopefully, hopefully it's fully accessible uh, and, and available. Um, sometimes I've had some technological issues with that. Uh, hopefully not this time. I wanted to begin by thanking especially Kid and Gavin for having us and for the year of conversation that led up to this presentation. I think it's really great that the MHS is putting on this month of um, disability related content. It's an especial pleasure to share the stage with, um, with Laurel and Nicole, uh, whose work I have been following and who have been interlocutors for years. Also, just as an audio description, I wanted to offer, I'm a woman in my early 40s and I'm using a ring light. <laughs> so most of what people can see is my face um, and I'm wearing black, a black and white outfit uh, with bookshelves behind me. So today I'm gonna offer some 
thoughts that I've been having about uh, it's some research and thinking that I've been doing about um, the history of the term disability in preparation for thinking about how I'm going to use it in the book that I'm writing on disability and citizenship between the American Revolution and the Civil War. Even as a disability studies scholar, I found articulating my thoughts about this in any kind of complete way surprisingly trickier than I had anticipated. So I want to share my exploration of the term disability, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries. In her exceptional book, Birthright Citizens, Martha Jones begins with an extended reading of William Yeats' 1838 treatise, Rights of Colored Men. Jones glosses Yeats' argument, quote, racism had led to, quote unquote, legal disability, exclusion from military service, naturalization, suffrage, public schooling, ownership of real property, office holding, and courtroom testimony, end quote. The language is Yeats's, but the punctuation grammatically suggests something uncomfortable about the phrase legal disability. Even as Jones works to capture the quality of Yeats's argument by using it. On the surface, the phrase reads like an ableist metaphor used toward the ends of exposing racist legal barriers. And yet Yeats almost certainly intended disability in its legal sense, describing situational impediments to rights, which was the word's most common usage through the early 19th century. The oddness of the use in Jones' text, half scare quotes, half citation, reflects definitions of disability that were shifting dramatically in 1838. But even today, the term retains basic instabilities that make it slippery. We must consciously, even overtly, engage with the politics of the choices we make when using the language of disability paying particular attention to the historical meanings of the words we use, to the concepts those words describe, and to perspectives of contemporary groups of disabled people whose histories we tell. Legally, disability had long described situations where, quote, a person is rendered incapable to inherit lands or take a benefit, which otherwise he might have done, end quote. Disability occurred through acts of ancestor, party, God, or law. Of these four, only acts of God included physical and mental impairment. Even here, such impairment included only memory loss, which impaired inheritance and quote unquote idiocy, a category deemed in need of legal protection and grouped with women and children. This legal idea of disability shaped cultural understandings, which in the 18th century named disability as, quote, a want of power to do anything, weakness, impotence, end quote, or, quote unquote, a legal impediment. Notably absent is any medical language, and in fact, disability was not a medical word. By 1828, Noah Webster had translated Samuel Johnson's phrase, quote, to deprive of natural force for his US audience as, quote, want of competent natural or bodily power, strength or ability as disability arising from infirmity or broken limbs, end quote. This definition more clearly described the somatic condition, but still one principally imagined as temporary offering a bridge between the situational notions of disability that had dominated in the 18th century and those fixed in the body which would dominate by the end of the 19th century. Nevertheless, disability, like its emergent legal companion, incapacity, which would replace the older legal definitions of disability, were considered situational and remediable for most of the early Republic where, as one American legal dictionary put it, quote, the incapacity ceases with the cause which produces it, end quote. Of course, even if the word disability had not yet come to be 
the central term to describe the social, cultural, medical, political, and legal mar marginalization and oppression faced by individuals with physical and cognitive impairments, it was beginning in the late 18th century, an emergent medical legal category requiring sharper definition. As Laurel Dane argues, this work began as early as the 1790s to adjudicate petitions of Revolutionary War invalid pensions, which drew doctors into the courtroom to evaluate degrees of disability. Still, granting this kind of authority to doctors in disability-related cases was, as James Moore has shown, in many ways the exception rather than the rule. It would take until the 1830 and 1840 censuses for disability-related terms, which is to say deafness, blindness, insanity, to shape federal census categories. And even though these words were not principally understood under the banner of disability. For the Black community, disability was a constitutive part of slavery, even if once more disability was not the predominant term for physical or mental impairment. The Middle Passage, as Nirmala Aravales argues, quote, is precisely the historical moment when one class of human beings was transformed into cargo to be transported to the new world, that black bodies became disabled and disabled bodies became black. And Douglas Bainton has persuasively shown that arguments for racial and gendered subjugation in the early Republic were predicated on a confluence of race, gender, and disability. As Stephanie Hunt Kennedy has shown, the language of disability was used by enslavers and anti-slavery advocates alike in their descriptions of African-Americans. Enslavers argued that African-American bodies were impaired and best fitted to the conditions of slavery and became disabled by freedom. While anti-slavery advocates argued that slavery cognitively and physically disabled African-Americans. That said, people seeking to unpack the relationship between race and disability in the past will likely seek finer gradations, distinguishing general discursive constructions of race from the lived experiences of black disabled people. While slave owners use terms including incurable, unabled, useless, and unsound, these designations were not stable descriptions of particular kinds of embodiment. Dia Boster writes that unsound was a category used by enslavers, quote, to assess the abilities and defects of their bonds people's bodies. However, there was no single system for assessing the physical, mental, or moral soundness of any slave, end quote. And quote, unquote, useless individuals, quote, performed necessary and occasionally difficult duties, end quote. Martha Jones's use of quote unquote legal disability to describe an 1838 text thus gets at a further difficulty of using the language of disability when writing about the early Republic. To use the word most often means a concept that was only coming to be available to the historical actors at the end of that period. Disability history in the early Republic thus usually involves a kind of strategic anachronism. I say this fully aware of anachronism's thorny complexities. Uncritical anachronism is often dangerous, rendering scholarship inaccurate, unrigorous, and at times perilously ideological. Nevertheless, strategically deployed, anachronism is a vital tool. It can surface and uplift histories of historically marginalized communities otherwise obscured. This is precisely why charges of anachronism are also frequently leveled to silence particular individual and community experiences, enacting a kind of violence against people working to enter topics from a different perspective. Words like disability, as scholars like like Cristobal Silva have argued, are necessary for thinking about the past, quote, precisely because they defamiliarize narrative histories, end quote, allowing us to see historical phenomena anew. Furthermore, as Greta LaFleur explains, 
writing historical scholarship is always to some extent, quote, an exercise in creative anachronism because we do not study or research the 16th or 17th or 18th or 19th centuries in any period other than our own, end quote. If we cannot escape anachronism, then it is best to be self-conscious about our choices, explaining precisely why we adopt some and reject others. Contemporary, the contemporary category of disability seen in this light is crucial for historical work because it allows us both to identify shared histories of stigma, exclusion, and oppression across groups of individuals who would likely not have seen themselves as belonging to a shared group and to trace the development of a modern category. But in self-consciously adopting modern categories to explore the past, we are also responsible to the communities whose histories we tell, to their struggles, and to their advocacy around language. As the political struggle for rights is ongoing and variegated, this linguistic terrain is necessarily complex. And I have a lot to say about that, but I am running out of time. So what I wanna suggest is that people who are interested in studying disability historically learn what contemporary groups use to describe their own identities, understanding that there are sometimes even divergences within a single group. Even as we study disability historically, disability is always a lived and evolving political category or set of categories. And we are responsible first and foremost to the communities whose histories we tell. Thank you. Thank you, Sari, that was amazing. I'm um, glad to be on this panel. Um, and I'd really like to start by thanking the Massachusetts Historical Society um, for their incredible support uh, of scholars, scholarship um, and historical learning uh, more generally, um, and for organizing this just amazing series of uh, disability focused events. I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists. Um, Sari Nichols works have been um, truly inspirational um, and transformative for my own. So um, it is a real honor to be on the program with them today. Um, and I am deeply grateful for their scholarship um, as well as their camaraderie um, in this growing field. And I actually do want to begin um, by emphasizing that the history of disability in early America is a, uh, a very small uh, but growing field. Uh, as has been discussed in some of the past panels, uh, disability studies and disability history are marginalized fields in the academy. The scholars, the few scholars who have been doing this important work, um, for many good reasons, have tended to focus on later historical time periods. Uh, primarily uh, the late 19th and 20th centuries. Historians of early America, meanwhile, have sort of occasionally addressed questions of, of the body, the mind, impairment, and works on other topics, um, medicine, poverty, slavery, but few have meaningfully engaged with the methods and perspectives of disability studies. Um, so this is a small field, um, but I do believe that this is beginning to change. Um, and I see this panel and this sort of incredible series of panels uh, as part of this growing interest in early American disability history. Um, and this is uh, wonderful <laughs> for me and other scholars in this field um, because I truly believe this work is crucial um, and it is pressing uh, for our world today. For just one example, um, we are coming up on our nation's 250th year anniversary. It is essential, I think, um, for disability and disabled people to be part of the ways that we're remembering our nation's founding, right? It is crucial that we recognize the ableism, uh, the dis disability, the prejudice, um, the discrimination uh, that was you know, at our nation's roots. It is also crucial that we recognize a long history of disability rights activism, um, advocacy, moments of inclusion in our early American past. Positioning disability and disabled people in this kind of early American history is really crucial um, to an accurate telling of our nation's story. Um, so in my a short time today, um, I'd like to emphasize three main points. Um, and these are drawn from um, many years uh, of research in this field, um, and also from a book that I am actively working to finish. And I'm going to share my screen um, so that uh, hopefully you can see uh, my PowerPoint. One second. Excellent, perfect. 
Um, so I'm hoping you can see that okay. Please alert me if not. Um, perfect. Um, so my first um, point is that uh, disability was a well-articulated and commonly used legal category in early America. Um, and by this, I mean the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. Um, and I know this is in, in slight opposition to what Sari was um, mentioning, so um, we can happy to talk about this more in the Q&A. Um, and in fact, many scholars have um, opposed this claim. Um, many have argued uh, that the category of disability uh, did not emerge until the mid 19th century, um, generally in, the, in a context of industrialization, right? So the argument here goes um, that the, the rise of wage labor, factory work, standardized hours and schedules, um, with these developments, employers began to prioritize people uh, with able bodies and able minds discriminated against those with physical and who they perceived as having physical and intellectual disabilities. I have found instead that disability, uh, a category rooted in physical and intellectual capacity is much older um, and that it was at work in early America. This early American legal category of disability uh, bridged impairment type. Uh, it was a collective term uh, used for people with say uh, visual impairments, um, limb differences, chronic illness, intellectual incapacities. The early American legal category of disability was also primarily rooted in labor, um, specifically an incapacity for socially expected labor. Um, so during the period, uh, the specifics of people's bodies and minds um, was actually less important than the kinds of work that they could perform. And early Americans would have recognized others as disabled um, when they had physical and intellectual uh, in, in conditions that prevented them from performing the work that was expected of them based on racial, gendered, social context. Um, and we can talk later in the Q&A too about ways that labor is still really crucial uh, to definitions of disability. Um, so on, I just, to just demonstrate this um, on the screen, you will now see um, a quote uh, from Michael Dalton who wrote The Country Justice. Um, so he's an English jurist um, and this is, uh, The Country Justice is perhaps the most widely used legal manual in the colonies. Um, justices of Peace would have sort of had this at, uh, many of them would have had this at their disposal. And he says, um, the person uh, naturally disabled uh, was the person who um, in either wit or member um, was so disabled either in wit or member as an idiot, lunatic, blind, lame, et cetera, not being able to work. Okay, um, so my second um, uh, main point um, is that the early American legal category of disability functioned as a rationale for civic exclusion. Um, so ability or able-bodiedness was um, a prerequisite for inclusion um, in, into the polity, the granting of legal, political, social privileges, uh, disability by contrast justified exclusion uh, and discrimination. Um, so uh, for example, during the 17th, 18th, early 19th centuries, um, disabled people were variously barred um, from voting, marrying, um, buying, buying and selling property, uh, making contracts, uh, serving in the military, serving in public office, um, uh, giving courtroom testimony, uh, immigrating, settling in towns, um, becoming members of churches, uh, taking communion at church, um, uh, living independently <laughs> among many other duties and rights. Um, so this is um, severe uh, exclusion from the polity. Um, and um, we can talk later in the Q&A too about ways that these exclusions um, continue. Um, so what I wanted to do today um, is, uh, although I, I am not in Massachusetts, um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is, and so I I'm just um, to put it together a couple of Massachusetts examples of this. Um, so here on the screen, you will see um, uh, uh, an immigration restriction from 1700 um, that uh, restricts entry from impotent, lame, or otherwise infirm people um, from entering the province. Um, here is a... Um, a tax exemption law. Um, so uh, from 1693, um, people who uh, through age, infirmity, or extreme poverty are rendered incapable. Um, people who are disabled by infirmities um, are exempted from paying taxes. Um, and so um, remember, this is exclusion from both uh, civic rights as well as obligations um, to the state. Um, here is um, a Militia Act from 1776, um, which kind of constitutes the army as of, of the able-bodied. 
Um, and then finally, this um, is a guardianship act from 1784 um, that places people who are um, labeled as idiot, non-compos or lunatic um, under the care of a guardian. Um, and this is really um, an exclusion from nearly all civic uh, duties and rights. Um, and my third um, point is that disabled people always resisted and negotiated these exclusions as best they could to their benefit. Um, in short, just as there is a long history of disability prejudice and exclusion, there is also a long history of disability rights activism and advocacy, um, extending all the way back to early America. The category of disability then and now um, was relentlessly messy and contested. Right, so there's this idea that disability is based on an incapacity for socially expected labor. But um, as always, you know, what kinds of labor, how much labor, what if someone could only work during some seasons of the year? Um, what about changing and evolving physical and intellectual conditions? Um, and, and always, you know, who decided, right? Who made these determinations? Disabled people capitalized on ambiguities and inconsistencies in the meaning of disability to work their cases uh, as best they could to their advantage. Sometimes people resisted the label of disability. So um, barred from voting, for example, they asserted their capacity to cast a ballot. Other times, people claimed disability. Um, and in doing so, their right to exemptions they considered to be advantageous, um, such as a, you know, a exclusion from military service um, and a deservingness of a pension. Either way, during the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, individuals actively challenged and negotiated the exclusions they faced. Um, so um, I'm sort of getting close to my time limit. So um, I'm going to stop there. Um, but I, welcome to ask me about specific examples of disabled people um, kind of actively uh, negotiating these exclusions um, in the Q&A. So thank you very much. My name is Nicole Belolin. Please, somebody, uh, let me know if you are having a hard time hearing or seeing me. I am going to take a moment to cut and paste a copy of my talk into the chat. So please bear with me. You can follow along. If you prefer to do that, then listen to me or watch me. And I'm just confirming that I didn't send you my <laughs> grocery list. No, looks like the right one. <laughs> Excellent. All right, thank you. I'll just echo what everyone has said so far. Thank you so much to my fellow panelists. It's truly an honor to be on a panel with Sari and Laurel. Thank you to the Massachusetts Historical Society for organizing this panel and for organizing the seminar uh, as a whole. Thank you also to our captioner and to our American Sign Language interpreter. Kid mentioned a chapter I had published recently about gout in early America, disabling form of arthritis. And I did make heavy use of an almanac turned diary and the MHS collection, which I've seen on microfilm but have not yet visited in person, which I hope to do someday. I am a white woman in my mid thirties with long brown hair and glasses. I am a public historian uh, specializing in objects that people used in early America to live with physical disability. I write about this scholarship, as Kid mentioned, for my fellow scholars. I also use it to research and at, or to advocate, excuse me, for accessibility in academic and public history settings. And I think we already have a question about that, which I'd love to talk about more. This field has shaped my career, but it's also shaped my values as a historian and as a human being. Today, I'm gonna to talk a bit about crutches in history, and I'm gonna use one particular crutch to talk about that topic. There are a whole bunch behind me, but here's one I'm gonna talk about in depth today. So I'm holding that up on the screen for you to see. 
I study artifacts like these in museums and archives. There are also a lot to be found on the market. <laughs> I have about a dozen in my personal collection. This is one of them. And when I bought a pair of crutches a few years ago at an antique store I really like, not this one, but another set, I was paying for them. And the guy at the register started talking about medical oddities. And I didn't really know why. And it took me a couple minutes to realize that he was referring to crutches as medical oddities. And this is actually a common reaction I get when I tell people what kind of history I study. And I like to use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that I don't see crutches as medical oddities at all, but rather something quite mundane associated with disability in early America and disability today. I, um, crutches, as you know, are probably one of the most commonly used assistive devices today and historically. If we were all here in person, I would ask you to raise your hand if you wanted to say whether you have used crutches yourself or if you know somebody who has used crutches, I am certain over half of you at least would be raising your hand. So there's something that we're all pretty familiar with. I'm going to focus on crutches as they were used in British North America in the 1700s and 1800s, using this one I have here as a jumping off point. Crutches have been used for thousands of years. One of the oldest depictions of them dates to ancient Egypt to the year 2830. My crutch was a gift to me um, from my husband and it is a historic artifact. It's made of wood. I am uh, showing you it, the crutch in its full entirety. It's quite long. It's a little bit too tall for me and I'm five, two and a quarter to give you a sense of size. It has eight sides to it. It has a nice patina at the bottom, meaning that uh, air and dirt have integrated or uh, interacted with the wood over time to create this new, new color. It's split at the bottom. There are some chunks taken out of it. So it's definitely been well well-worn. It probably dates to the first half of the 19th century, which is something that we know based on design and the way it's constructed. The maker's unknown. It probably though would have been made by a cabinet maker or a chair maker or a carver, anybody who would have worked with wood. And one of the interesting things about this material is that Crutches like these, unlike the crutches you might get today at a chain pharmacy, are very flexible. You can alter them yourself quite easily with a set of tools. One of the most interesting things about this crutch is that if you look really closely, you can see that there are a bunch of initials etched into the crutch. Now, we don't know for sure how or why this was done, but I have a sense, or I can guess, that it was probably a tool shared by multiple people, or it might have been a way of uh, signing, signing the crutch, like we sign uh, casts today. There is a similar crutch at the Connecticut River Museum that has initials on it also, along with dates, and descriptions of the types of injuries people had that caused them to have to use the crutch. Now let me talk a little bit about the function of crutches. So today, if you wanna consider a medical perspective from the Atlas of Orthoses and Assistive Devices, crutches do everything from enhance balance to facilitate propulsion. They also alert others that the person might need, and I'm quoting here, special consideration. These are important functions. Uh, we can assume people in the past use crutches for those purposes also. But now I want to take a little, a few, a few minutes to talk about crutch use in history. 
and feel free to add your own perspectives to the Q&A. As my co-panelists have said, and as I'm sure others have in this series, disability was and is not a monolithic experience by any stretch of the imagination. So the first thing I wanna talk about with crutches is that crutches uh, have interesting things to teach us about time. Crutches could be used temporarily. That's mostly how I thought of them when I first started studying disability. In my experience, uh, having a injury that could heal quickly, I used crutches for a short period of time. I used them to get from point A to point B, maybe for a day or a week at most. Um, but in fact, some people use crutches for long periods of time. James Logan, for example, who was William Penn's secretary. Logan lived from 1674 to 1751. He injured his hip in 1728, and for the next 30 years or so, noted over and over again in letters that he was, quote, confined to crutches, end quote. So that's a very different way of thinking about disability than I did, and then perhaps that the people who used this crutch did historically. And I wanna back up for one second and mention that other crutch that had initials etched into it along with mine and note that I think those initials uh, speak to the way that these objects can be very personal, but also shared. Now we know that with the example of Logan, crutches helped him get around on the first floor of his home, but they also helped people work and travel that may have been great distances. So let's contrast Logan's experience with that of somebody else who was running away. If you have any familiarity or work experience in early American history, you might have heard of runaway advertisements, which can be found in early American newspapers. And I'm going to quote briefly from one from 1799. And in these runaway advertisements, people put them in the newspaper because somebody tried to get away from them, like somebody they had been enslaving or someone who was indentured to them. So for example, uh, this is a quotation, a Negro man named Nathan, about 29 years of age, one leg is of no use to him in walking, it being withered, and very little larger than his arm. He hops along upon a crutch. He was a shoemaker by trade, a good strong workman, carried off with him a set of tools. Now that runaway advertisement for me poses lots of really fascinating and interesting questions about time, mobility, labor, and how all those things relate to disability. You might also think about the relationship between crutches and other tools. Crutches were not just used in pairs, sometimes they were used alone, sometimes they were used with canes. I have one image that's in my collection of a man, I'm holding it up to the screen, and you can see he is pictured here with a crutch and a cane. So people with disabilities use the entire material world around them. They did not just interact with crutches as medical objects, which is one way that we often think about them today. Artifacts like crutches are really important because they tended to be very visible to observers. And these items often became a part of users' identities. Perhaps what is most important about the crutch is that disability was not monolithic and certainly not an oddity as many people sometimes think it was in the 1700s and 1800s. And I hope that talking about objects like crutches opens up the topic and the world of disability history to all of you. Uh, if it, especially if it's new to you. And I hope that it's something to be interrogated, but also celebrated and embraced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drs. Dane Altshuler and Belolan. Let's um, move to the next portion of this program, which is a discussion with all three. So if you could switch on your cameras. All right. I think we should start with a question that's particularly rebel relevant because we are the oldest historical society in the nation, an archive. And I'm curious to know about um, any challenges you faced in searching for stories of people with disabilities in the archives 
How did you overcome them? And how might archives and historical societies perhaps do a better job in making them available or, or, or listing them more prominently, given that in some family histories, they may have been obscured um, intentionally by the family members themselves. So whoever would like to start? Laurel, you've worked in this archive. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, yes, you're exactly right. So um, there are challenges um, of, of actually, you know, of locating material. But I will say, um, you know, that hasn't been my uh, primary experience. Um, actually, working in this field, I I, I find um, there's there's kind of common phrasing um, uh, in disability history that disability is everywhere once you once you start to look for it, um, and that's really really true um, in the archive, right? So um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of materials that are relevant um, for this topic. And it is not, as we've discussed today, like not only conditions that may be viewed medically or not only um, conditions that are sort of impairments, but there's a, it's a wide range of viewing um, disability um, and a variety of contexts, a variety of sources. Um, so I would say that it is, um, it is, it is out there everywhere um, and it is really, um, and I, I do think that um, having sort of, you know, taglines and search lines uh, among historical societies would be, um, it's sort of a really great and archival, um, a great practice. Um, but I think it's out there and it's, it's, um, it's everywhere. I, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in next. And I think this is probably the benefit of maybe working a little bit later than Laurel does. Um, although I do, I, I have so much that I actually, you know, would love to talk about um, in terms of our, uh, maybe we should take our, our show on the road um, in, in terms of uh, just a, um, the uh, different ways that we're kind of looking at a, at a similar archive. But because I work a little bit later, um, one thing that's been really interesting to me is that in disability studies and disability activism, the idea of the institution, it's really like a kind of a boogie word, right? Like the institutions are, are watchwords. These are places that have obviously, um, some have committed awful atrocities. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, skepticism and, and concern around the idea of the institution. Um, for me, actually, I found a lot of the materials um, for my own research in institutional archives that are the institutions that actually sort of first brought together people with similar kinds of impairments. So um, the Perkins School for the Blind in, uh, in Watertown, um, the American School for the Deaf in Hartford. Um, these are, of course, uh, you know, institutions where you wanna take the, the materials with a grain of salt, but if you're looking for a particular kind of impairment, and I've been focusing my research more on thinking about histories of particular impairments and how we, we might kind of weave them together, um, those are fantastically underused resources. Um, and they have a lot of their own materials, for example, um, at, at, uh, at Perkins or at the Philadelphia Institution that was its kind of counterpart. They have materials that are just, uh, they, they were very expensive to produce, so they don't exist in a lot of our other archives because they, for example, include a lot of raised print. And, you know, and in them, you can find a lot of uh, resources of um, materials that were actually produced by the students or produced by uh, people who, who were residing in these institutions. And that's actually a really great place, I think, to look for um, first person accounts. Even if it is, you know, a magazine that was produced by the institution, you're still getting um, the direct testimony um, of disabled people in an earlier period, which I think can just be a kind of, you know, magical and fantastic resource. So I would highly recommend that people look in somewhat less, uh, less traveled spaces. I would just add to that, that uh, there is a movement among some archivists and librarians to uh, beef up, so to speak, their use of subject headings to help scholars and the public find resources on disability history. But as Laurel and Sari are suggesting, it really is everywhere, which is one of the fun things and fascinating things about it. This field is so young, but we are now using disability as a lens to rethink all the things that we thought we already knew. Well, why do you think that this, uh, this field has been slower than others, perhaps, to embrace disability history? 
is it because of, I mean, as you're saying, the sources are everywhere. So what, what do you think is behind this? Uh, I, I think for many reasons. Um, one I think might be the the common misunderstanding, and I and I don't mean to call anyone out or say say people don't know a lot about history. It's just it's a really new field to lots of people, and so people just don't necessarily think about disability in early America. Um, and as Laurel and Sari talked a lot about, that term in and of itself uh, had a, it wasn't used the same way it was today um, to to talk about disability. And I guess another reason uh, might be, uh, as as others have pointed out in settings like these, that uh, and as Laurel alluded to, society, for um, unfortunately, in some cases, remains very ableist. And that word means that people uh, tend to uh, favor able-bodied people in activities and other parts of life. And, but the, the great part about this field is that since it is growing and since um, folks have been studying the later uh, time period of disability, more and more people are learning about the field and I think uh, unlearning uh, ableism. Do you mind if I add one? Please. Um, yeah, and I, I do think that there's a real, um, and it's uh, this kind of alluded to, it was alluded to in another question that I noticed in the Q&A, um, but, um, you know, ableism exists and it's real strong today, right? And, and so, I mean, that's a reason, right, why people are not questioning disability in the same way that they may have questioned other identity categories. It hasn't gained um, such um, a, a prominent following, um, at least, especially among scholars, and our scholars are, are behind here um, in many ways, but, um, and that's an issue when, in my work, I often think, you know, why am I, why am I stopping in my work at, you know, 1840s, right, you know, why am I ending there, you know, all, a lot of these exclusions, um, this, this ableism continues right, you know, to today, so why, you know, why are we making uh, particular choices um, to stick in early America or, or have some kind of periodization? Um, because, you know, the exclusions that I study continue. Um, and so I think that that is, those are reasons that people have been um, slow in the uptake. What is the effect of war on people's understanding of disability in colonial and early America, whether the Revolutionary War or wars before that? Does this change um, how people view this? I'll leave this one to the historian since I really am an English <laughs> professor and more of a cultural historian. So uh, please. Oh, Laurel, do you, do you wanna go ahead? Oh, either way. <laughs> oh, no, please um, go ahead. Okay, um, so I think that's a great question. Um, I think um, maybe um, some years ago, I would have uh, answered um, that war was really transformative. Um, maybe, and so legally, for example, like the revolution was um, incredibly important um, in terms of um, growing uh, sort of benefits or recognition, particularly among soldiers. Um, but I, I'm less certain of that position now. And in fact, I would suggest that um, maybe there was fewer changes um, because of war. I will say with the American revolution, um, one thing that I think it really did change was um, I think after the war people start to use um, the language and ideals of the revolution to challenge disability exclusions. Um, and that's something that I see really um, regularly in my work, right? So using um, this language uh, of the revolution to kind of contest, um, contest structures. So that's one effect of that particular war. Um, but um, yes, I think disability is, is, has been historically, you know, among the field, um, you know, understood a lot in the context of war, but I'm not sure it actually deserves such a huge place um, in our in her historical thinking. Thanks. Nicole, did you want to jump in? Oh, sure. Um, I would just add that, you know, war is super important. Um, it, but it, and it's especially because it remains a touchstone for, I think, the general public. They, it's almost the first thing that comes to mind for most people when I talk about disability historically. 
uh, but I, I think in the early time period uh, that it, it's slightly less important than maybe it becomes later in the late 19th and 20th century. But that's also not my area of expertise, so. Let's switch gears a bit. Uh, we have a question from Rebecca, who uh, wants to know what advice you would have for someone writing their master's thesis on mental illness in the American colonies in the 1600s, what primary sources might be available. And we can expand on the question to, well, anyone uh, doing research in this period uh, who wants to use disability history as a lens. Any advice? Oral? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think um, there are many places to go here, and it's a really exciting topic. Um, there has been just limited scholarship on that, um, and I'm thinking of um, uh, Marianne Jimenez's work um, and a couple others that I, I, I can <laughs> send you later. It's escaping my memory right now, but um, I think um, ministers records, uh, church records would be really important to that um, conversation. You know, I'm thinking about just, um, you know, cotton mothers, <laughs> um, journals, and uh, copious writings, right, would be really crucial there. Um, I think it would also be wonderful to, to look at um, the writings of individuals, um, diaries and letters. Um, I think you might find that um, this information is much more um, apparent in these sources than you might expect. Um, I think, um, yeah, those are just some starts. Nicole, do you have anything to add on that? I don't, I would just encourage everyone uh, listening who's interested in this topic to look at uh, a variety of sources, uh, institutional sources, like diaries, as Laurel mentioned, um, literary uh, sources as, you know, Sari studies in a lot of depth, um, visual sources, you know, don't, um, don't limit yourself, I would say to one, one genre. Sari, do you wanna add yeah. anything? Yeah, the only other thing I would say is that, uh, um, especially in the colonial period, but even extending into the 19th century, I think it's always important to think about this in a transatlantic context, so, or in a circumatlantic context. So, um, you know, as Laurel and I, and I both talked about it from different perspectives, um, the kind of legal definition of disability means um, that, that uh, yeah, a lot of the conversation that's happening is being drawn from um, Anglo, legal precedent. Um, and so in that sense, I think uh, it's important to contextualize whatever is happening in the colonies. Um, but even, as I said, into the well into the 19th century, American law is deeply indebted um, to British law. And, and so understanding what's going on in England, about which there may be many more so sources and thinking particularly of, uh, of Roy Porter's work, um, that's just the book that's that, that's one of the one of the writers that springs to mind. But there's much more work on that in the British context, and I think that's a really important place to start, kind of um, getting your bearings. Um, I have a question um, uh, from someone who is a physical therapist who would like to know if there are references before the 20th century to, century to rehabilitation of persons with disabilities. Have you come across any? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they uh, quite a few, um, and certainly, uh, you know, if you expand it beyond the just the context, which maybe uh, actually Nicole might be best <laughs> best prepared to answer the physical rehabilitation question, but uh, but other kinds of rehabilitation. I mean, I think that uh, the institutions that I was talking about. And this is, I think, part of where the sort of. Um, uh, my own feeling about the sort of like consolidation of categories in the mid 19th century comes from is is that there's actually a huge push after the revolution to think about institutions that can re that can rehabilitate um, people with, dis with with disabilities into American society more broadly. So that's what the, these, especially in the institution building period, beginning with things like asylums for sure, but also um, uh, with schools for the deaf, uh, schools for the blind, um, these kinds of institutions, their purpose is actually to make disability uh, somewhat obsolete um, in a certain sense. And, and so um, I don't know if that's a broader capture of, um, of the term rehabilitation <laughs> than, a, than a physical therapist is looking for, um, but certainly I think there's a huge impulse toward rehabilitation, uh, especially I would say in the teens and 20s. Uh, 18 teens and 20s.
I would just add that um, certainly not physical, um, not physical therapy in the way we think of it today, but uh, people, for example, when they first started using artificial limbs in early America, knew and talked about or wrote about having to acclimate to using a new object that in some ways now became a part of their body, which I think qualifies as a form of um, physical therapy. Uh, people also, uh, especially rich people like James Logan, depended on a lot of other people in their household, enslaved and indentured, family, friends, on helping them get around. And so, for example, uh, I know one form of physical therapy uh, involves uh, not, uh, for example, rehabilitating yourself after you get a knee replacement, but uh, moving a person in a hospital setting, for example, or at home. And so people certainly weren't using those terms, but it was a part of everyday life. Right, and uh, we're conscious of time, so let's um, end with one uh, big broad question, inviting people to do research uh, on disability history in early America. What would you like to see done? What topics would you like to see covered uh, in this field? Maybe this will be someone's dissertation. This is really, yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I have so many things that I can't think of any of them at the moment, but um, I would say questions of language, I think are really important. I think Sari would, would kind of echo that. Um, questions of language, I think um, there's also, you know, so much to be done in this young field that it's just, you know, it's take your pick. Um, there's so much material out there. There are so uh, many topics uh, to cover. I mean, like, it's so limited um, what's what's there right now. I mean, it's incredible, but it's limited. And so um, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, histories of history of the family, history of poverty and disability, I think would be amazing. I think history of, of religion and disability is crucial and missing. Um, it, there's just, there's just too much to, to mention, but I would say just start, start anywhere. And um, I think the sources will guide you um, towards a really fascinating uh, project. I have kind of two answers. Um, one that that has uh, really interested me recently, and I would love to see more people work on, is the relationship between specific communities of people with disabilities and the idea of disability more broadly. So there actually are a lot of histories of particular kinds of impairment, um, and but those have been done largely by people within those communities, um, for those communities, and they're really wonderful, but they're often kind of disconnected from broader broader conversations about disability. So one thing I've been really interested in is trying to connect those things. There is tons of work left to be done, um, I think, in that vein, though. Uh, and then, I mean, I think the other thing, I teach, I teach courses on disability and literature, and one of the reasons why I love teaching them is that um, it's one of the only places where you really can have students look at a text from a disability perspective and there isn't an article already written about that. And so I think really at you know, any given text, um, you're unlikely to, unless you've sort of gotten it from a book on disability, um, you're unlikely, it's unlikely to have that kind of reading and application. And so, um, so I think that's really important. I guess uh, the, the third thing that I just thought of while I was speaking is, just, you know, um, people are doing intersectional work, but there's always more need for, for more intersectional work, especially with disability and race, um, disability and gender. And again, certainly that's part, that's a dimension of a lot of the work that, that exists, but it's also something that disability studies has been called to task for. Um, and so I think thinking in those kinds of intersectional ways always <laughs> as a kind of starting point is really important for, for work going forward. Thank you. Last word to you, Nicole. Uh, as my co-panelists have said, there's so many different directions you, go, you can go, which is one of the awesome things about disability history. The final thing I would say is don't get discouraged. If you have a hard time finding a mentor or a scholarly community, it is small, but we're here. And uh, this is just such an important topic. I hope everybody uh, finds it interesting and um, a, thing, a thing to think with, as we like to say. Thank you very much. And back to you, Gavin. I uh, just want to thank you all uh, for a wonderful program and a great discussion. Um, I also am aware of the fact that we didn't get to every question in the Q&A, but we will pass those on to all of you so that you have a chance to see them. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, and I also 
want to uh, thank our partners um, who have helped us promote this. Um, and I know that this is a lot to read in a, in a few moments, but uh, there have been some uh, great institutions that have helped promote this. If people are interested in learning more uh, about this series or finding um, what we've done in the past in this series, uh, you can visit masthist.org slash disability, uh, and you should be able to find everything there. So uh, without further ado, I just thank you all, uh, and I hope you all have a great evening.